Hey everyone, Matt Bailey here. I've just uh, finished up an interview with four absolute legends of the Tasmanian whiskey industry and I really appreciate you clicking on this video to watch that uh, round table, if you want to call it that, Tassie Whiskey Chat as I called it, uh, on a Friday night. It was fantastic uh, seeing the community come together, share great stories, experiences and memories of, of everything and also having a bit of a deep dive into what they look, what the future of uh, the Tassie whiskey industry looks like and indeed the Australian whiskey industry. It's something that we're always keen on talking about and we're always keen on bringing this, this to our members and I really appreciate you watching this. So here we go. Wait for that coffee to keep you. You tired, Matt? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, I am. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it looks like we are just about live at the moment, which is fantastic news. And uh, of course, the first screen grab that the, uh, the live stream caught of me was me rubbing my eyes. <laughs> so that, that was a, that's a good look. Um, thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, I'm just getting all the stream set up. So sit tight for just a moment. Uh, we've got some very special guests for this Friday night special broadcast. Um, so bear with me just for a moment and make sure this is all uh, sitting nicely. What's going on here? Why is that going like that? Okay. No, 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 I want to make sure this all works, otherwise I will miss out on some of the comments coming through. Yep. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome. My name is Matt Bailey, I'm the National Ambassador for the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society here in Australia. Uh, I go live every single night of the week uh, with special guests, sometimes a solo rant as you, some of you will know, and I'm very honoured tonight to present to you uh, no less than four guests on the show tonight, which is really, really exciting uh, because we've got, um, there's all these great people in here right now, which you can't see just yet, but I promise you they're here. And uh, I'm going to introduce them all. And we're all going to have a chat about some of the history, some of the current, some of the future of the Tasmanian whiskey scene, what the Tasmanian whiskey scene looks like at the moment and ask them some of their stories. And it's all about the stories and bringing members together like we do uh, every single night here at the SMWS. <laughs> so thank you everyone who's been tuning in. There's a lot of people jumping on live right now. So I'll do a few reintroductions as we go along, but I'm gonna unspotlight my video so you can see everyone. And we're all gonna have a great evening talking about everyone. So I'm first gonna introduce John Jarvis, who's joined us from Devil's Distillery. We've got Bill Lark, who, if you don't know who Bill Lark is by now, then I think you need to jump off this stream. No offense. And of course, um, Casey and Jane Overeem of the Overeem uh, story right here as well. So thank you everyone for tuning in. <laughs> we got everyone. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So it's, uh, I'm just going to do a big shout out to everyone who's tuned in at the moment. Thank you so much. Steve, Darren, Adrian, Dan, Crafty, Robert, Birdie, Birdie, Birdie. Good to see you, mate. Uh, Ali, Joel, Danielle, everyone's tuning in. Well, uh, good to see you all. Um, this is a Friday night whiskey roundtable. It's a chance for us to all have a chat, talk about some of the uh, stories and some of the history and some of the uh, opportunities that might exist in Tasmanian whiskey and your take on those. So I might just start by with John, actually, I might just start asking you a, a bit of a question right. to you. Um, yeah, absolutely. This is the eve of World Whiskey Day, by the way, as well, because this is, this is a cool opportunity for us to sit and have a dram. Why not? It's the <laughs> night before World Whiskey Day. So. <laughs> now I'm going to preface this question by saying we've seen, um, I like to think of different chapters, if you like, or different eras in Australian whiskey. We sort of got the, the very, very early era. We've got that 1820, sort of 19-ish, 1980s-ish kind of realm. And that was sort of, there was a lot of action then, but a lot of spirit being made in different areas. There's the, the, the realm after that, which I, I guess Bill and Casey had a huge part of here, which is sort of that 1991, 92 era onwards. And then I, I would actually go so far to say that 2014 to now is sort of like that third era in some ways. And that, that a lot of that was spurred on by different 
uh, distilleries. And I, I can safely say a lot of that was spurred on by uh, the Sullivan's Cove Award, things like that. And that's that sort of next realm of putting Tasmanian whiskey on the map. So you started Devil's Distillery in 2014, 15. Tell us some of the story behind it. Yeah, all right. So um, we're, we're a small family-owned distillery. Um, we started setting up in 2014. We just, you know, um, I've worked with the director since then and we just wanted to make whiskey. That was it, just simple as that. I think uh, from memory, we were distillery number 10 or 11 in the state, but we, we flew under the radar for quite a while just sort of concentrating on setting up and doing what we wanted to do. And even now we sort of, we're not overly vocal about what we're doing. We're very, I find, I think, I feel like we're pretty transparent with what we're doing, but we're not sort of really pushing, you know, pushing that much. And well, we're small, we're basically two and a half operators. So we don't have a lot of stock. We don't have massive volume anyway. Um, but yeah, it's just really, you know, we, we're inspired by, the other Tasmanian distillers. Um, it's probably way too early to be going into this, but you know, it's such a good community to be in. Um, you know, uh, Bill Lark, Mark Nicholson, Pat, uh, the Oakrams, everybody's come out to the distillery and seen us. Everyone, we're all good mates, we all get along, and everybody shares a dram, which is great. And it's the best industry I've ever worked in. That's yeah, funny. yeah, amazing. And what was the inspiration behind starting uh, Devils then? It, what, where did that idea, what was the genesis of that? Uh, and Hobart whiskey, I should say, for those who don't know. Hobart whiskey, yeah. So uh, look, we just we just wanted to make whiskey. That's it. We like whiskey. I yeah. especially like whiskey. I like a lot of whiskey, uh, and I really just you know we just wanted to go out and just make this Tasmanian product that we could. We wanted to be a part of the culture and the, the industry, and and make the products that we can share locally and with the world. We just wanted to do that. Um, so the distillery is owned by a local businessman, and. Um, it's just family and he just basically lets me do whatever the hell I like. Yeah. Which we're going to get, we're going to get back to that point because you make some interesting product, but yeah, okay. single malt story I think is, can be largely attributed to one of our other guests, of course, Bill, uh, you were yourself and Lynn sort of kickstarted a lot of this in 91, 92. I'm getting that right. I think. Well, yeah, we got our license in 92. Yeah. Um, but I think having Casey and Jane here is a, a really good thing because really it started before I got my license. It started with um, getting a little still at an auction. And we'd had this dream for a, quite a while to make whiskey, but um, it might the not trout, have gone. The trout fishing, right? The trout fishing. Yeah, everybody's heard that story. Yeah, everyone's times. heard the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a 45 pound brown trout from. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> up road. Anyway, look. Um, I managed to get a little still, but uh, at that stage, all I knew was I loved drinking whiskey, but didn't really know what to do with this still. And uh, another good friend of mine, who was a friend of Casey's, is a friend of Casey's, um, said, you ought to go and talk to this bloke down at Blackman's Bay, you know, without giving away any secrets. I think he might be doing something in his garage of a night. And um, <laughs> I went to visit Casey with my father-in-law, who was the health inspector for the local council. I forgot to tell Casey I was bringing him along. But uh, I turned up and opened the door. Casey nearly fell over. But that was the start of, um, of, of where we are today, really. I like to think we, you know, um, we put the still together and um, we played cards and we drank a bit of grog coming out of the still. And um, it was really the inspiration for me to get going straight away. And I, I'd like to think it was the inspiration for Casey to fulfil one of his dreams to eventually start a distillery as well. Um, and that night was a great night in the garage. Casey will remember every time a car went down the road, we ducked under the window. <laughs> it was a great night. <laughs> the whole, the whole, I guess, Tassie industry then has come like a, a, an awful long way since then, as evidenced by even like uh, John's story as well. So, C Casey, what are what are some of your recollections of that, of that sort of early era, that sort of 1989 to 92 sort of era of of spirit? Um, yeah, the uh, Bill's Bill's nailed it. He's uh, he certainly um, yeah puts a bit of uh, uh, spice with the story, which uh, uh, isn't is isn't untrue. But um, yeah, the yeah uh, the he's an uh, ambassador. He's allowed to embellish. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but we uh, it was it was really a um, uh, a start to um, to the to the industry. I think yeah. um, I'd been uh, messing around 
in the shed for some years um, with a with a, a so-called still, but it wasn't really yeah. Uh, in today's terms, you wouldn't even call it a proper still. Um, and I was only really producing neutral spirit. Um, but that was the uh, the start of the industry, um, or the start for me. And yeah. then uh, to meet Bill, um, and then to, to, to start producing with a, a proper little copper still um, was the next level. And um, yeah. Is, is that the still that's sitting still in the, in, in the cellar door at Lark still today? Is that... Oh, that's a slightly bigger version of that little still that came. Yeah, right. Doing. Okay. Yeah, sure. Just a scaled up version of it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and my original one was a plastic urn. <laughs> I remember. With a uh, little, yeah, a little <laughs> copper pipe coming out of the top of it, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that went into a uh, a coil which was inside a little first box, pops, and that was the uh, condenser. Um, and uh, yeah, it was uh, it was a bit of fun, but it was uh, pretty amateurish. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and what what year was it that you finally got that still in your sort of the shed beneath it, that lower down from your house there? Uh, that that came about in about uh, two thousand and five, so it was some right. uh, ten years after Bill. Um, although um, I had been messing around again probably a little bit more professionally um, prior to that still being uh, installed mm. in, the, in the shed. Um, it, uh, it, it was the beginning of Overeem or the old Hobart distillery. Yeah, right. So there's, like I said, there's a, long, uh, a lot has happened between sort of that 05 and 2015. That's, and it's only 10 years that the, that's, it's changed so much. Uh, what have you, Jane, in your, in your experience, I mean, because that's, that's more closely linked to your uh, your career in it as well. Uh, I think it may have been two thousand and nine or ten when I first met you, uh, and it was there, there was that you were uh, you were at the you were at the distillery and you were involved with it then. Yeah, so around two thousand and nine ten is when we were distilling. So I learnt to distill with Dad in those early years. Um, and then it was end of 2011 when we launched Overeem and that's when I really got involved. Um, early 2012 was when I, um, I packed up and went to Sydney with a boot full of whiskey. Um, and that's when I started sort of, yeah, really starting to get Overeem out there and getting to know people at the bars and restaurants and bottle shops. And, and that's when I really, really fell in love with the industry. Yeah, I, I actually recall you showing me your... Uh, early sketches for different bottle designs. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. yeah. yeah a folder full of different sort of uh, different ideas for what Overeem would look like on a bottle. Yeah, there was a dog jumping over a river. I'm glad we didn't get that one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was over the Eam. Over the Eam River in Holland. All so. right. <laughs> and what was the, yeah. and where did the decision come from to use Overeem as a, as part of the brand rather than Old Hobart Distillery? What was the, the idea behind that? Um, that was, um, that, that came about through a, um, uh, through a guy that we commissioned in WA and um, he was coming up with certain ideas and I commissioned him to come up with a name for our, um, for our whiskey as well as, um, yeah, sort of um, to design the brand and the image that would go behind it. Mm. behind that and um anyway he started playing with certain things he was very professional very very good and um he came up with uh he rang me one day and said casey he said we've we've designed it and we think it should be called Overing." <laughs> and i said well i said if you're going to call it that i didn't need to commission you because it was the last thing i really wanted <laughs> i said I yeah didn't right <laughs> want to name after the um anyway yeah uh, after he showed me the design and he said how balanced the name was and that sort of thing and uh, that it would fit well and that it could be easily recognised worldwide um, and easily spoken. Um, like you can, you can imagine that there's uh, a lot of brands from Scotland and that, that people find very difficult to pronounce. To pronounce. So a Bruick Laddick or something like that. They look yeah, at yeah. the bottle. And people still get it. Don't worry. I won't order that over the bar because I don't know how to say it. Yeah. Um, well, he said over him. He said anybody can say it. 
and they look at it and it's an easy thing. And he said, so that was an important uh, part. And I thought it was very, very valid. You could say the same about Hobart whiskey or you could say the same about Lark whiskey, really. It's, 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 a, it's yeah. yeah, it's that's yeah. A clever decisions from all there. Um, Actually, or John, I still can't believe you managed to register Hobart whiskey. That just still astounds me. Yeah, I, was, I, was, I, was, I don't know that. why it wasn't registered. It um, sort of baffled us as well. That's for sure. Getting yeah. getting uh, getting the name Hobart whiskey is is yeah. a pretty is pretty uh, is pretty cool, especially for for getting that in 2014 15, as you said. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Well, um, I don't think we actually knew we wanted to call it Hobart Whiskey when we started, which is why the distillery itself is called Devil's Distillery. We just sort of started getting things done and the brand came later. Yeah. Um, well, speaking of which, I mean, it's, I've sort of asked a bit about the last 10 years in, in, case, uh, in the case of Jane and, and some of those stories that have been in the last 10. I think a really interesting sto- uh, question I'm going to ask next, but before I do, uh, we've had a, quite a few people ask, what are we all drinking tonight? So I just want to grab those on the comment sec- section coming through at the moment. So, uh, John, what have you got in your glass? <laughs> uh, so I have this unnamed, unlabeled bottle of oh, yeah. <laughs> whiskey. <laughs> um, Distillery X. Yes, that's right. Yes. The, the bottle may look familiar, though. So um, normally Friday nights, I find they're really good just to sit down and sort of Pork samples, obviously quite large cask samples to, you know, yeah. <laughs> for the weekend. <laughs> uh, Bill, yourself, what, do you, what have you got in the glass? Well, I've, I've got the my favourite, it's the Lark Classic cask, and I'll tell you why it's my favourite later, and it always has been. But when I finish this very shortly, I'm going to be drinking my daughter's whiskey, Kalara. Ah, a bit of Kalara, there you go. <laughs> yeah. So I've got a couple lined up, ready to go. <laughs> yeah, it's always good to have a plan. Yeah. Um, uh, Jane, uh, Casey, what have, we, have we got a dram in front of us at all? Yep. Yeah, I've got Launceston Distillery tonight, yeah. supporting one of the other Tassies, and I'm really enjoying it. Actually, we've, Mark's enjoyed most of the bottle, but <laughs> I'm just trying this one now for the first time, and I'm really enjoying it. Which bottling is that? Uh, and for me, it's a uh, new stone. Them. Yeah. Um, from Holland being a Dutchman, I thought I'd better support the Dutchies. Yeah, yeah. And uh, <laughs> quite enjoying a little millstone here. Yeah, um, lovely stuff. I'm in Holland. And uh, for those wondering at home, I'm predictably drinking an SNWS single cask. I'm going with a 26.136 candy floss and carousels, which is a, a mm. nice, uh, brisk whiskey from a waxy distillery, that one. Uh, uh, we're getting a, a a thumbs up from Millstone from Oliver there, and um, Crafty. I hope that answers your question. That was one of those questions was from um, Oliver. Uh, uh, sorry, from Crafty Field there as well. Um, we'll grab some more questions as we go along. But um, I guess what the next one of the next qu- questions I want to ask you as a group as well, just to take each of your takes on this, um, was uh, just looking at sort of the next, looking at the next ten years in in Tasmanian whiskey, and I'm talking quite specifically Tasmanian, as I think it often has its own. Well, its own identity within the Australian whiskey landscape. Now, one of those points, if you want to touch on, is of course about. I know there's been efforts in the past to, and maybe still is. I haven't been following it as closely. I'll, I'll admit, but there's been efforts in the past to form an appellation uh, to for, yep. for all the spirit. I, I'll ask, I'd like to ask you all: Do you think that's a good idea? Do you think it's achie- achievable? And what does that look like for the next sort of the next development of Tassie whiskey? I know it's a big question, but. Bill, do you want to kick us off on that one? Yeah, look, it's it's a, it is a big question, but it's a very important one, and it it sort of came around about we probably started thinking about this Appalachian idea about I don't know five years ago or more when it was apparent that around Australia um, people were sneaking in spirit from overseas and calling it Scottish whisky, and it wasn't. Um, and it occurred to us that as Tasmania was building up such a good brand we needed to protect ourselves from that sort of thing happening. Um, imagine if somebody got a hold of some rubbish neutral spirit and went to the home brew shop and bought a whiskey essence, added that to it, and they, at the, at the moment even, they're quite able to call it Tasmanian whiskey. And imagine if it was bad and rubbish and people thought, gosh, if that's Tasmanian whiskey, we don't want it. And so we thought we really need to protect the really good quality and the good brand that we built up over the last 20 years. And so we went down this path of, of trying to achieve an appellation. And I think 
it's something that we'll look at across Australia eventually. But we thought we'll start with Tassie because certain things can happen in Tassie being a small state and we've got really easy access to politicians and things. Tasmania is where the wet tax that is now across Australia started from here in Tasmania. And so with help from Tasmanian government, from ASIC even, um, and even federal politicians, we've been putting together um, the start of what will be a, um, uh, a geographic indicator for Tasmanian whisky. Um, it'll be the first such thing for a whisky in Australia um, uh, and in any anything like it. And um, we're hopeful that that'll come through. We've had to work on the definition. That caused a little bit of a, an interesting debate amongst some of the distilleries. What is Tasmanian whisky and how far do we go in protecting those things that make Tasmanian whisky, Tasmanian whiskey? Or even Tasmanian spirit, it, yeah. more broadly. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, but I think we've worked through that now. and We've reached a really good uh, understanding of what that is. And we're just working through the process of getting that geographic indicator approved by ASIC. And, um, uh, and then uh, we've, we know we've got the support of the state government in this. And once we've done that, it'll, so there'll be a definition for Tasmanian uh, whiskey and a definition for Tasmanian single malt whiskey. And I think if we can achieve this, right. we'll be able to then go to the ADA and across Australia and develop a, a, an appellation for protecting Australian whiskey, Australian single bottles. Yeah, yeah. I, I recall um, I was actually, um, it was a conversation I was having with uh, Robbie Gilligan um, mm -hmm. a, a while back, a, a few years ago now. And there was a, I don't even remember the brand, but it wouldn't be good if I did anyway, because I wouldn't announce it. But it was a, there was a, a gin there was a Tasmanian gin being made a while back, which was uh, the spirit was all being imported from a distillery in Adelaide or something. Yeah. Like it was, but it was being labelled as a Tasmanian gin. And it was sort of like, well, that's not, is that really Tasmanian gin? It's not really. It's No. So yeah, it's just an effort to try and avoid any, any confusion and, and just protect not from anybody within the industry, but it's to protect the brand from, um, you know, things that happen outside of our control. Yeah. Uh, John, yeah, what's know, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, go on, Bill. You, you were talking about, you know, where we've come from in the next 10 years. And so just sort of leading into that, I'd like to think we've really been through the golden era. We've had the golden years of, um, of this industry, mm. and certainly here in Tasmania. Um, and I, I, I'm not saying that's going to end, but uh, we started from a base of nothing to uh, quite a number of distilleries where we've all really worked on being a collegial group of people and that's helped grow the industry across Australia. And it still is extremely collegial. I think we're just about to enter another era though where some of the distilleries ha are going to go big. They've got corp become corporate and I don't say for a second that's a bad thing. No. Um, and I, I'm, I'm sure they're still interested in making very good whiskey, but um, what, what I think one of the challenges for our industry going forward is to make sure we hang on to that collegial attitude. John mentioned it before, you know, it's a wonderful industry to be in where you're all good mates with all the, all the other members of the industry. That's a wonderful thing. We want to hang on to that more than anything. Well, I was actually going to ask that a little bit later on about, um, do, do you, you don't, I get the impression as someone who comes to Tassie often, but not, it doesn't work directly in Tasmanian whiskey. I get that uh, impression that, it's there's there's not too much fierce rivalry between the distilleries. You you don't see too much of a, a sort of almost you know fist fights between uh, Casey Overham and Bill Lark in the on the high street, um, which is which is a nice thing. And that's often the opposite of a lot of uh, I think American distilleries where you do hear of all these crazy stories of distillers punting each other on and stuff. Yeah, look, I think there was the potential for for us to lose that, but uh, I think we all really love that aspect of what we're doing so much that you know we do still want to work together with each other and we still want to remain good friends. And, um, and that's even with the big distilleries, you know, you've got uh, people like Mark Littler with Hellyers Road and look how big they are. But Mark is just as much a friend as any of the, as the smallest distillery. And he yeah. works with us and he's now the president of our association. Um, yeah, you, know, yeah, you can be a big distillery, but still we can all be collegial and still remain good friends. I think, I think in terms of your comment about scale of distillery as well, I, th I, I think we'll see more uh, scale of distillery, especially on the mainland, perhaps yeah. as we are, as we already are, but it's, uh, it, it, it could also happen more to Tasmanian whiskey as well. 
there was a little bit of a debate going on social media a year or so back about what is a craft distillery and the people were trying to define what a craft distillery is and people were trying to come up with oh if you're over certain liters then you're not a craft distillery i honestly think that doesn't matter a rat's bum whether you make one liter of whiskey or you make a million liters of whiskey i think the important thing for us to remember is how you make that whiskey that's, yeah, I, that's I, I the totally definition agree. of craft whiskey well, yeah you have to come down to defining what the word craft means to begin with and then work out scale is unimportant in that respect i would say well, i think scale is totally unimportant it's about how you make the whiskey yep uh john in that original question of thinking about the next 10 years uh, i'm sure in in some capacity you've at least thought about what devil slash hobart whiskey looks like in 10 years and what tassie whiskey looks like in general as well um yeah well you would think that we had a a, a good 10 year plan wouldn't you um <laughs> me and so our, maybe, a three year, maybe a three year or something yeah, <laughs> well, maybe like a three day plan if we're, if we're lucky um, so i i work for director rocky and uh we sort of we're both very similar in the sense that um uh, we we talk on the phone a lot and we discuss a lot of ideas but it's just like a big bowl of spaghetti you know we're sort of still just trying to pull strength out and know what we want to do uh, so there are a few things that we, when we started up, we knew what we wanted to do. And that was, um, you know, basically I, I just make whiskey that I like. Essentially, that's it. Um, I've got a, our head distiller, Ben, now, who does pretty much all of the operations. I, um, I, I don't really know what I do. I'm just there doing something. Uh, and basically, you know, we just solely concentrate on making whiskey that we like and we put it out to the market. And, and that's it. Ten years from now... Um, we we don't really have big plans to scale massively. We don't want to. Like I think I said, we're a, we're a two and a half man operation. It's Dan, myself, and my wife works with us part time, and it's just. What's your what's your what's your uh, output at the moment? Your production look like? Uh, so we have an eighteen hundred liter pot still from Peter Bailey. Uh, at the time, it was the biggest one he'd made, I think. Uh, and we do. About Good, surname. Good surname, that Peter bloke, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. 200 litres a week, basically. That's uh, where we're sitting. And um, look, we, we could do it's more. quite small, yeah. yeah. We, we could do less, but we're just, right now, we're just concentrating on making the best product we can, making the best new make, doing the best brewing, we do all, all the brewing on site. Um, and then we can think about scaling it up if we decide to. Uh, but... But running a distillery is, is hard work and it's yeah, yeah. work. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, um, you know, as fun as it is, we just, we don't know if we want to go too much bigger. We just sort of want to find a sweet spot and then think about growth and what we're going to do. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Um, in, uh, and Casey uh, and Jane, how, how about for you guys? I mean, it sort of, you've also had, you've had an interesting trajectory through Overeem Distillery. And then Jane, uh, you and your partner, uh, husband, Mark, um, with Salford Distillery, and then now, um, now everyone knows the news. You've uh, you've got the Overeem name back. So, what does the ten next ten years look like for you, but also for what you what you see as Appalachian and the Tassie industry as a, as a whole? What would be the crystal ball from your end? You go. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, as you said, Matt, like our plan, plans have um, significantly changed. Um, Mark and I were two and a half years into production at Salford Distillery. Um, and yeah, we were ready to start from scratch again um, with some five-year-old whiskey in 100 litre casks in 2022. And um, we were just chipping away. Um, and then, yeah, it was late last year that we were approached to get the brand back. And um, and now we're, we're almost there. So end of June, we, we officially take the brand of Overeem back. So um, yeah, our plans change pretty quickly, but uh, obviously, a, a great, a great, um, exciting thing that we can now, yeah, move on into the future with Overeem again, and um, yeah. and we actually plan to launch another brand in 2022. So that's pretty exciting. Um, you heard it here. So, you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> breaking news. <laughs> yeah, you did. You actually heard it there first. So yeah, awesome. Um, yeah, so that's going to be pretty fun. So two brands under the Overeem Distillery into the future. Um, so yeah, 10 years for us looks really exciting. We're going to have 10-year-old whiskey, 12-year-old whiskey, 15-year-old whiskey. You can't wait. Yeah, wow. Yeah. yeah. Which is an interesting point about age statements that we can jump back into later. Um, 
whilst we're whilst we're just at this point now in our chat, I might grab some of the questions from um, some of the crowd, and anyone can answer these. Um, uh, Crafty asks, as a, as a mainlander distillery, how does Tassie promote Tassie whiskey, but at the same time promote Aussie whiskey? Curious how it works. Um, I, I, as far as I'm concerned, you know, if I'm specifically talking about Tasmanian whiskey, I will talk about Tasmanian whiskey. But wherever I get the chance, and especially if it's in an international arena, I will talk about Australian whiskey. Yeah. I think that's really important to me as much as it is Tasmanian whiskey. Yeah. Um, I don't have a problem with that. And, and, and I, you know, um, but you, you have to think about it from time to time, but uh, to make sure that we, we're inclusive of the whole of Australia, that's, that's an important message, even as a Tasmanian whiskey, to, to make sure that when we go to the world market, we are primarily an Australian whiskey. Um, yeah. So, you know, but, but uh, there's no doubt about it. I guess we've, we've um, created a Tasmanian identity, a bit like Isla a bit like Highland, a bit like Lowland. It's just a regional area, a regional um, branding situation. But that's no, yeah. a good question from Crafty. And um, I'm sure Crafty talks about, you know, where he, you know, Kapiti and where he comes from, but he's still an Australian whiskey at the end of the day, I'm sure. Yeah, well, especially uh, as he says, he's a mainland producer. So he only, he talks about uh, uh, Australian whiskey rather than as yeah. a category of Tasmania, um, which in that, uh, Ian Scott actually had a question regarding that last question. Uh, Will a Tasmanian appellation restrict the distiller's ability to experiment slash produce different styles? That's a very good point. Uh, what do you reckon, John? Do you think that an appellation might be restrictive or? No, I don't think so. I mean, uh, when we, we sat down as, a, as an industry and drew up sort of what we wanted it to be, and I, I don't feel it will, will restrict anything at all, uh, much like Bill said. It's more just about uh, the industry has grown phenomenally over the last few years. Um, and just to ensure the quality is of, of the highest quality that we can all produce. I think it's important to have it there to protect, protect the industry in Tasmanian whiskey. Yeah. Um, but in terms of restrictions, um, don't quote me on this, but I, I'm pretty sure we didn't restrict it to being Tasmanian barley. Um, mm. You know, it, there's still a lot of lot that can be done. It, it shouldn't yeah. be restrictive at all. No, no. And um, there was also one more, one more question here from Chris Cornell who is a distiller himself over at Archie Rose, who's following in tonight. And he asks, um, in terms of classifying single malt, uh, would this be following the Scottish model that uh, spirit production has to, be, has to occur in a single location from brewing fermentation through to distillation? What do we think about Casey? Do you want to weigh in on that at all? Um, my understanding uh, of the single malt as far as Scotland was concerned was that it was, uh, uh, that it was from a uh, single distillery. Um, and not necessarily brewed on site. Um, I don't see that it is necessary to brew um, to brew the the you know to brew the uh, the wash the, the, the wash on site. It's probably for the smaller distilleries. Um, it, it's it's quite uh, handy to be able to go to a local brewery and pick up your wash and distill it. Um, and I don't think that would take away from it being a single malt. No. Uh, Bill, any thoughts on that? <laughs> um, is that a can of worms comment? Is that a can of worms? Uh, it was a fairly contentious issue. I can't exactly recall how we uh, ended <laughs> up with it, but uh, I don't have a problem whatsoever with um, buying your wash from a brewery and then, and then bringing it to your distillery as long as it's made to your specifications. Okay. Um, and I could have a big distillery where my brew house is in a separate building to my distillery house. Um, and I've got to brew, bring it from that brew house to the still house. What's the difference between bringing it from a brewery down the road if it's made with your yeast regime, your barley specifications, everything else is barging temperatures. I really can't see the difference. So on a personal level, it doesn't worry me. I know there's some debate going on on some of the social media sites about um, you know, distilleries that are, aren't brewing their own wash aren't really making a, a, a proper single malt whiskey. You know, look, I can understand some people feeling that, but personally, I don't have a problem with it. And I think it's what's really enabled the Australian whiskey industry to, to, to get to where it is today, that most of us started by buying wash in. I certainly mm. did. Uh, I used to buy my wash from a small microbrewery um, 
But at some stage, I was desperate to brew my own wash and I couldn't wait to get my own brewing facilities. And that's okay, I did eventually, but I, 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 um, I needed to go down that path to start with. Um, so look, I think uh, it's one of those things where it's helped the industry to grow and I think we don't want to discourage people from coming into our, our industry. Um, mm. And if that's what it takes to get started, I think that's a great thing. Yeah, okay. Anyone else, anyone else want to jump in on that one? Otherwise, it's all, I'll, I'll keep moving on. Um, uh, so, yeah, it, there's, a, there's a good question that has come through, which is actually kind of very closely linked to, to one I already had down here. Um, in terms of challenges ahead for, for the category of Tasmanian spirit, or, or let's, we could narrow it to Tasmanian whiskey, of course, um, for some of the challenges ahead, some of them that I thought could be identified would be uh, procuring uh, a steady source of wood and, yeah. and a steady source of barley and a steady source of other uh, raw materials that are needed. Uh, is there, and, and of course, talking in market as well, uh, the question that came through from David Taylor here was uh, with 56 odd distilleries in Tasmania, can we, do you think that they can support more? Or do you think there's a bubble waiting to burst? So it's sort of like, it's a, an in-market question, but it's also a, a raw materials question. <coughs> uh, let's just focus on the first, focusing on that first point, point for a second. Uh, that supply the the demand on wood is obviously quite a quite a um, an issue could be an issue and it's uh, something I want to just take your chew your ear on a little bit here just to, as an idea and Jane have you do you want to start with anything you can any challenges you see there in terms well, of yeah I've I've definitely seen it change um, first of all I mean the prices have obviously gone up which is which is just you know that's fine but it's actually um, yeah, sourcing the good wood. Um, when when Dad and I, or when Dad was sourcing wood early, um, when he first started Overeem, all the all the port and cherry casks he were getting in were, you know, hundred plus years, or fifty years, fifty plus. years plus. Um, <laughs> you know, and that was just what was coming in. Whereas now um, we have to. That's a special order for us to get the the really good wood. So yeah, it's definitely um, it's definitely a lot harder to get now, which is is one of our big challenges and Mark and I are doing a lot of work in regards to that. Um, and it's yeah, all through, yeah. it's all mostly one channel as well. It's, it's just, well, I mean, for a lot of, for a lot of <laughs> distilleries, it's a lot of it is, um, is through TCC or is, is direct source. And it, that yeah. must present a challenge as well, being almost like a, not monopolistic. There are other ways to get wood, but of course it's, it's, uh, it certainly has its challenges in terms of supply surely. Yeah. Well, our cooperages are doing such a great job in yep. sourcing good wood. You know, they'll ring us as soon as they find some good stuff that they've been able to secure, how many barrels, what they can give to us. So, you know, we are really relying on our cooperages at the moment to do that. Um, and I mean, I know a lot of distilleries are having to, you know, start looking into it a bit themselves. And yeah, it is definitely getting challenging. Well, yeah, and on, on, uh, on that note, I think um, that there'll be more um whiskey matured for the long term in um american oak bourbon casks uh and um that they will be finished in uh in the port and uh, sherry barrels and um and wine barrels rather than putting it for the full term in the uh in the wine barrels that we've been used to in the fortifiers i i mean on my view personally on that is that i i think the more bourbon wood we see the better um, I, I think it's a, I think it's a staple of the whiskey industry around the world, and there's no reason why it can't be a staple of the Australian whiskey industry as well. Uh, Bill, is, you're about to. Jump. Oh, sorry, yeah, that is a strategy that um, that I think the Salford Distillery are moving towards, um, and of course, it, it's time. It takes time because you've got to put um, your 200 litre barrels down um, a little bit longer, unless you cut the bourbon down to a 100 litre barrel. Um, but this is quite costly. Um, and so I think to mature them in the 200 litre barrel um, is, is most cost effective and in the long term will bring the price of Australian whiskey down, uh, which I think um, is also <laughs> something that we can talk about at some time. <laughs> yeah, that, that, I, I will touch on that, trust me, I'll oh. get to it. But uh, <laughs> you, you can't, unfortunately, you can't have a conversation about Australian whiskey without talking about pricing. Um, Bill, you were going to jump in on there, sorry. You, on oh. that. Look, just to add to, you were, you were making the comment that 
uh, you mentioned one cooperage, but we're lucky here in Tasmania that we've actually now got three cooperages. Oh, I need to update my list. There you go. <laughs> you do. And, uh, and, and as Jane mentioned, they're still able to find some good wood for us. Yeah. And uh, um, we, we've gone through a period when I started, I was able just to go to our local cooperage and I could get pretty much whatever I wanted. Um, but as the number of distilleries grew, of course, we've seen the industry grow. And it's not so easy just to go and get the, the barrel that you would like. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that we liked to do was to put our whiskey only once in a, if it was an old port cask or a sherry cask, and that was it. We, we had the luxury of being able to go and get another um, first fill port or sherry. Th those days have changed, but... And refills, we're seeing, we're seeing refills now being used, which I think is, is an interesting move. And, and I'd, I'd say, if executed properly, a welcome one, surely. I think it is now too. I, I really liked the idea when we started. It was at a time, and, I, and look, I, I've always, I, the only reason I got into this was because I love Scottish malt whiskey. And the industry, the Scottish industry has been a tremendous help to us still to this day. Mm. But it was at a time, and I think they, they were talking about it themselves, when the demand for Scottish whiskey had grown so much that they were using first, second, third fill barrels. And there was discussion about how some of our great Scottish whiskies, whilst they were still fantastic, weren't the same as they were 20 or 30, 40 years ago. Yeah. And um, so I came along and thought, well, this is great. I can just continue to use first fill barrels only. And I yeah. think for a while that was good. But look, I put my hand on my heart and look back and I think to myself you know some of our whiskies were probably overcooked with some of those characters and what I'm discovering now is and I was very nervous about putting whiskey in a bourbon cask and I guess it was because back then a lot of bourbon cask whiskies had been second and third fill bourbon casks and hadn't contributed much to the whiskies now what I'm discovering and I think Casey and Jane have talked and John I'm sure will feel the same Tasmanian whiskey seems to work really, really well in a bourbon cask, and I'm loving that. Right. And uh, Jim Murray has made the comment often that he thinks um, a second fill barrel produces a much better whiskey than a first fill barrel. Well, when it, I was able to get plenty of first fill barrels, I disagree with him. But <laughs> on reflection and over time, um, I'm tending to agree with uh, Jim and people like Charles McLean, who's said it as well but I think some of our better whiskies, if you choose your barrel properly, will come from a second fill barrel. So this whole barrel issue is really, um, it's becoming a challenge, as Jane mentioned, getting the barrels you want. We're moving into an era where we're starting to look at second fill. Um, Casey mentioned that we'll be using some bourbon barrels like they do in Scotland to mature and then finish in some of these other barrels. All that's facing us right now and is ahead of us. And that's going to produce some um, exciting times for us, I think. Uh, yeah, that, that is interesting. And I, I also want to jump uh, over to John on this. As a, as a relative newcomer to the scene, uh, relative, sorry. I mean, five years is a long time already. But <laughs> as a relative newcomer, however, it's um, how, is it, how have you seen you, uh, your ability to source wood in that time, especially when you're jumping in uh, when so many established players are obviously have contracts and fills already with, with cooperages? Yeah, so I guess um, we we still sort of got in to the industry a little before the big boom. Uh, one yeah. thing we did was we we sort of foreseen there would be a bit of a shortage of oak, so we invested pretty heavily. Uh, we actually dropped a container straight to Tasmania. Um, we were uh, back then. Adam Bone from Tas Cast Company was you know guiding us for what we should be doing, what we should be getting. Um, and because we're producing such a small amount of new make spirit, we don't probably don't have as many challenges as some of the bigger distilleries because we just don't have the spirit put into wood. And it just gives me a bit of, I guess, a bit of uh, flexibility, a bit of, I can sort of cherry pick what, what comes across to us. So yep. um, obviously, you know, the, all these elements are so important for making good whiskey. So our early days, we were buying Moobrew wash. We decided we wanted to do our own brewing to have that element of control. Um, we try to make really good, clean spirit and we try to get good wood. And we just, because we're doing such a small amount, we feel like we can tick most of these boxes most of the time for now. Um, but one big thing at the moment is cask seasoning um, is happening a lot. We 
you know, it's something we're looking at doing and we've experimented with. We did a rosé cask. I mean, who else does a rosé cask? It's just we yeah. have a bit of flexibility there to try these different things. Um, and not having those kind of SWA regulations that dictate you can't use this type of wood or this type of seasoning. That's right. Like for some interesting rosé casks and red gum wood and stuff yeah. like that that I've seen a bit of going around. Yeah. So I think it's just um, one thing that I'm very conscious of is I just want to disclose exactly what people are getting. Just be transparent. This is not matured in a, a cask that had rosé for 20 odd years. This is how we've done it and what it is. Um, just having accurate information and even, you know, we, we do a lot of finishing. We do, we marry casks together because ultimately we're just trying to get a really good end product. That's what we're aiming to do. And I think just having a bit of an open mind to do that has helped us sort of accomplish that along the road. There was actually a question just before from Joel Bradbury who says, uh, how do you all feel about the seasoning process that the likes of TCC are implementing? And um, they, they can sometimes season barrels in just hours. I don't know if that's true or not, but um, it, that, that's, but um, it, is anyone else here got any um, takes on seasoning going on at the moment, especially for Cooperages? It's, it's obviously not uncommon elsewhere in the world. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know probably enough about it, but we've um, yeah sat down and tasted some really good seasoned cast, did a blind tasting with a fair few of them. And um, yeah, we were very surprised that some of the ones that we loved the most were from seasoned cast. So we yeah. couldn't tell the difference between some or we just, we, we actually preferred them. So, um, but for us, I guess, yeah, it's just one of those hard decisions to make. You know, you put something down now and you've got to wait five years to know whether it's going to be good. So. Um, I definitely would like to try it, but it is one of those um, sort of big decisions that you've got to make internally. Yeah. Uh, there was a comment from Peter Bignall here who's been watching along. And <laughs> Peter says, uh, when I started 10 years ago, there was one Cooperage in Tasmania that wasn't getting enough work. And now, as Bill said, there's now three, mm -hmm. uh, which, is, which, is, which is a, posit it's a positive comment. It's, it's, it's showing the growth of the, of the industry. And that's, I think that's a really good thing. I, I can imagine there'd be four or five before not too long, especially if it, if it keeps growing. Um, uh, there's also um, there's a long question here from Joel Rinaldi. I might have to come back to that one, but here's a question from Dan Woolley, who's tuning in as well. Hi, Dan, who, uh, who we all know very well and, 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 uh, and used to be a uh, brand ambassador in Melbourne. And welcome to the Australian Distilling Seat, Dan. There you go. <laughs> a proper Dan. Um, Dan says, hey, you gang, what's the general consensus of a junior ducket seasoning a cask with Coca-Cola and then aging a yeah, new spirit yeah. to make it a whiskey? <laughs> Can't comment until I tried it. No, no. If, it if it's a good it whiskey, down. I mean. If it's yeah. a good whiskey, it's a good whiskey. <laughs> Who's tried it? Has anyone tried it? That's what I, I don't know if anyone's tried it. I mean, apart, for, apart from um, Louis, I don't know if anyone has tried it. I think it's just a, a work in progress, but. It's kind of that there's no law saying that can't be done as, as a Coca-Cola seasoned wood. So there you you've go. Got love, you've got to love the ducats. <laughs> yeah, you've got to love it. <laughs> True madness. It's fantastic. Um, Sam Licardi, who it works in the Tassie whiskey industry himself, says, um, I love seeing Tassie whiskey in bourbon casks. I think refills are going to be great for the Tassie spirit. Yep. I, I tend to agree. And, and it, oh, I'm just going to, just on that point still, there's a lot... Um, there's a lot of great ex-bourbon uh, whiskies coming out from around Australia, of course, and some who have been doing it for a very long time, like the likes of Bakery Hill and whatnot. But yep. there's, there's a, I think seeing uh, ex-bourbon wood and even great refills uh, can, can as, as Bill, you were saying, they can impart an incredible flavor, especially if used over a longer period of time and in a larger format cask. And if it's a good, if it's a good spirit, it's going into a good cask. Or if I'm um, to paraphrase your old quote, which I might get a bit wrong, um, shit in, shit out. And if it's... <laughs> that's good. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, Crafty says that rosé cast, mate, was very interesting indeed. There you go. Uh, uh, here we go. Uh, Paxarette. I know I spelled it wrong, but thoughts. I know Mr. H loves it, but what are, what are our panel thoughts on Paxarette? Have they stopped doing that in Scotland now? Hmm. I'm gonna I'm gonna go yes I think or I don't haven't seen any uh, Scotch whiskies that have been influenced by it but I, you do see it in Taiwanese whiskies quite a bit and you yeah. see it in a lot of new yeah. old whiskies but yeah look I, I don't know it's a it's a question we should discuss and we haven't really discussed it because uh, as Jane you've talked about yourself 
um, going into the future, we're going to have to look at seasoning barrels. And I think a smart distillery into the future will probably look for a supply of fortified wines that they can put into casks and leave for a number of years and then move on to other barrels as they decant those to put their whiskey in. I, I mean, that's no different to buying a, a port barrel from Portugal um, and yeah. maturing your whiskey in that. Um, and so Paxaret, that's, uh, it's kind of an, an intense fortified, isn't it? I guess um, in some yeah. respect, uh, um, I don't know. Look, I, I, I don't have a, an opinion on it one way or the other, but I think it's something the industry should talk about. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I just want to jump in on that, otherwise I'm going to get to Joel's longer question here. No, I agree. Oh, good. Uh, so Joel says, uh, "I've had some. I have. I've had and currently have some fantastic Australian whiskey, but at the same time, I've had some very average ones as well. I love supporting our local whiskey industry, but there seems to be a faux pas around criticising Australian whiskey. Sometimes it's almost un-Australian." Uh, do you think uh, it's necessary to offer feedback to new distilleries in regards to this? And how would us as consumers go about it without the distilleries feeling insulted and disheartened? It's a very good, it's a very good comment because it's often, a, as, you, as you all know, it's a, it's a labor of love and you're producing the spirit and you wait years for it to mature. You put it in a bottle and then someone on social media says, this tastes like garbage. It's like, it, 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 it's, it's got to hurt. So it's kind of like, how do you offer that kind of feedback? Is that feedback necessary? Is that, do you like reading uh, criticisms? Is it, how do we all sit on that? John, I'll start with you. Yeah, so um, look, I think it's, uh, it's an interesting question. I personally, I love getting feedback on any whiskey we put out the door. We have a you know, somewhat rigorous tasting panel that we'll go through to make sure it, it ticks the boxes we want with the whiskey. Uh, quite often, I'll send samples out to industry people, friends and other people I know just to get feedback. Um, but ultimately, uh, whiskey, one thing I love about it is everybody's got a different idea of their perfect whiskey. Uh, you know, this person may love it and this person may hate it. So uh, just after we did our first release, uh, Cam Brett from Spring Bay rang me and he was like, John, I'm so excited. Just remember, some people love it, some people hate it. Just make what you love and you'll be right. And that's essentially all we do. Uh, if somebody didn't like our whiskey, you know, someone can walk up to me and say, just didn't like it. And I can say, why didn't you like it? If they just stand there and don't give me a reason, that's all right. I'll still respect that. But um you know, I especially we're quite new to the industry. Uh, we're still learning, and we we appreciate this feedback. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're, there's still so much to learn. I I feel like everybody people just learn forever. So any feedback, I I wouldn't see it as unpatriotic or anything like that. It's just you know, it's a labour of love, like you said. But um, so it's everything. So it's painting a house. If you paint a house because you're a painter and you do a shit job, then you know, wouldn't you want somebody to tell you you do a shit job? Um, you know, you'll get better. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> um, Bill, I mean, your story is kind of self-explanatory in that, in, in regards to that question. You were, you wanted to produce a whiskey that you would drink. Like yeah. you wanted to produce, like that's what the gen genesis of Lark was. I mean, I'm guessing yeah. it's the same with you, Casey. You, as your, your stories yeah. of traveling overseas and seeing those, uh, those little distilleries, under house distilleries and shed distilleries and coming back saying, why can't we do this here? I mean, that's. Yep. In a nutshell, and um, we did try to produce something that um, that we would like, um, and of course we were sort of in the pioneering stage where we didn't know whether we'd be able to sell our whiskey at all. Uh, when well, Bill especially, but even myself, when I started putting it in barrels, uh, you're only going on by what uh, yeah the new make was good, so you just had to had to. Um, <laughs> trust that the barrel would do its job and that the that the whiskey would be accepted by the market at the end of the day um, and fortunately for us um, it did and um, it was accepted and I think um, for a lot for most distilleries their whiskies are accepted and, uh, um, but I, I, I have got a comment to make here that might be a little bit controversial and that is about the uh, the, the very small cask aging I think it's a little bit hit and miss uh, more so than if you're going to a 100-litre uh, barrel. Um, if you're mucking about with 20-litre barrels, I think that you've got um, a, a, a chance, a, quite a high chance, that um, a percentage of your whiskey is going to either over-oak before it's got any sort of maturity attached to it. So it needs to be re-barrelled um, re or, or, you know, mm -hmm. um, finished again in something else to try and bring it up. And uh, so I think the sooner that 
distilleries, the smaller the, you know, the, I know you've got to start somewhere, but I think um, the sooner that they progress beyond the 20 litre barrel, mm. the sooner that they'll get a, a higher quality whiskey. It's it's funny you say that, and it's 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 something I can actually I don't think it's that controversial. I think it's a it's a, a take that has been more and more being widely accepted in Australian whiskey production that these twenty liter barrels have not be, have been mostly to the detriment of, of the spirit rather than to the to the benefit of faster aging. Uh, and I'm one of the people that doesn't believe there's such a thing as faster aging. I think it has to time is time, and you can't cheat that. Um, but it's it's uh, that's an interesting point, and then it's. Um, but like I say, I, I agree. Everyone has to start somewhere, especially if it's a new distillery. But it's uh, that the twenty liter thing. In fact, on that very on that very point, one of my most recent visits to Tasmania, I was I was visiting someone over at um, a colleague over at uh, Sullivan's Cove, and I, lo- I looked down from the top balcony at the the casks area there, and they're they're rolling all these twenties uh, to be disgorged to be put into two hundred liter casks. Yeah. They, said, well, they, they said these twenties aren't aren't working at all, so they were taking the bungs out of all of them, rolling them into a into a vat to fill into to re rack into two hundred. And I thought smart decision to at least admit they weren't working, and it's a I guess it's a waste of a lot of wood as well in the in the end. Yeah, they're expensive barrels too. Yeah, yeah. twenty liters. Yeah, they were fifties, I believe. Oh. We bought some um, off uh, Sullivan's Co. Um, they were fifty liter barrels. I'm yeah. not sure if they were the same ones that you're referring to, but they also were decanted and put into 200 litre barrels. Yeah. Um, and I actually bought some of those 50 litre barrels because um, I thought they'd be very good. They'd had short term uh, maturation and mm. were already, in in the distiller's opinion, were already over oaking. So um, that's why they decanted them for a different maturation. And I thought, well, now's probably a good time to try a second fill. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we've now filled them with new mate. All oh, right, okay. So, what happened to the fifties that you bought? Where, where's the, where did the spirit go for those? Just the empty barrel, Matt. It was oh, just sorry, the empty barrel. Just yeah. the empty casks. Yep. And sure. so we filled them with new make, and we'll just see what happens. Bit of yeah. private collection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just get it. Just put a kick on the bar case. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bill, what? In the early days of Lark, what were you filling into mostly? Because I know it's a lot of hundreds and two hundreds now at Lark, and uh, yeah. but... um, our very first barrel was a five liter barrel. <laughs> <laughs> the, the the trouble with that was I just about drunk most of it before it was ready. To <laughs> but I can tell you, the very first bottle that ever had excise paid on it in Tasmania since eighteen thirty nine came out of a five liter barrel. There were only five bottles, <laughs> well, the time, five small bottles. Yeah, we've, yeah. We've broken four of them. I've got one left on the top shelf behind me um, from that that first barrel. But uh, look, it, it is an issue, uh, uh, an interesting topic, and Casey's sort of spoken well about it. Um, but having said that, some of the best whiskey I've ever had's come from a twenty liter cask. And in fact, about three years ago, um, a whiskey that won the best whiskey, uh, best Australian whiskey. A single cask whiskey in the in the World Whiskey Awards came from a twenty liter cask, um, but there is a danger. And Casey mentioned it quite well. You have to watch these casks so well. Like you know, at two years they can be terrific. At two years and three months they've gone over the top. You, it's that critical. So provided you're diligent about the watching the cask and being ready to take it when it's ready, you can actually produce some stunning whiskies. And so. Um, I think for a distillery starting, it's a it's a good way to get a whiskey out into the marketplace sooner than later. And you you would only do it for that reason because, as Jane mentioned, they're expensive. It's a very expensive way of maturing whiskey. And as Casey mentioned, there's a danger that you can overcook them and spoil it and end up with a whiskey you can't sell. Um, yeah. Look, looking back to my early days. Um, I didn't know, like Casey said, I didn't know whether anybody was going to buy our whiskey or not. And I remember we had our first release in 1998 um, and we only had a few bar- a few bottles, not a, not a big release. And um, a Scottish chap came into the distillery and he said, what is it you're doing in here? You're not be making whiskey, are you? And I said, as a matter of fact, we are. He said, would you better give me a taste? And I said, I'm sorry, sir, I can't give you a taste. I've only got a small amount. I can send you a taste for three dollars. <laughs> he goes, well, got his three dollars out. And he said, well, pour me a glass. I gave him a taste. He went straight to the back door, and I thought he's going to spit it out. And instead, he yelled out, "Hey, Mary, 
come in here. They're making whiskey and it's not bad. And he bought three bottles. Yeah, very cool. Okay. You know, um, but, but that was a good experience, except with my hand on my heart, I look back to those first releases and I actually think in hindsight, they were probably still too young, mm. you know, and I think a lot of distilleries made the mistake that I made. I, and I put my hand on my heart. I made it. I released some of my whiskies too soon because I needed cash flow. I'd managed to convince myself that it was all right. Some people were buying it and loving it. That's great. Um, but, you know, um, I think uh, nobody likes criticism. Um, you know, we all ask for it, but we hate it when we get a, a, a critic, a critique that's not favourable. Um, mm. But I think we've just got to toughen up and learn from it. It's a, it's a very important part of um, growing this industry. Um, yep, sure. I mean, I know people, strangely, that don't like Lafroy, but it's a cracker of a whiskey. Look, it's okay to be wrong sometimes. Uh, oh, yeah. that's, what, that's what I'm, and I think that's what Casey was alluding to. Not everybody's, or John, sorry, not everybody's going to like every one of our whiskies. No. Um, sadly, I'm one of those people, I'll drink anything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, look, um, uh, it is difficult, and yes, I know some people are copying a bit of criticism. Um, it's but some, well, some of that criticism is around pricing, which is the, sort of one of the points we wanted to touch on. Before we get to pricing, however, there was a um, a, a question from Darren Howie, and he was asking uh, how how closely does the Australian wine and whiskey industry work at all? Oh, that's, that's poorly phrased. Sorry. Do the Australian wine and whiskey industry work at all closely together? The quality of our Australian wines, you'd think would mean that there should be great quality casks for finishing or, or for even full maturation. There's a fair few Australian wine casks obviously around. I mean, some distilleries mature exclusively in them. If you look almost, you know, like, a, of course, like distilleries like Starwood and others, like it, it utilize wine casks quite a bit. Well, the way I, I think of it, Matt, is that what is a fortified wine barrel, Port of Sherry? It's, it's a barrel that's had a, a, a fortified wine um, matured in it. And what is a fortified wine? It's a wine that's been stopped during fermentation with strong alcohol. So um, using a wine barrel that's been shaved and recharred and putting strong alcohol in that barrel is a bit like a deconstructed fortified wine. Yeah. Um, and from some of the wines that I've tasted, and I, the very first wine uh, whiskey I ever tasted from a wine barrel was Glen Goyne, matured in an Australian Shiraz cask. It was a cracker of a whiskey. And it, it had all the characters of a great sherry cask whiskey if you like it had those floral toffee notes it was it was a ripper of a whiskey um so yeah look i, I think into the future there, there is a relationship we can have with australian wine yeah awesome and and in your case uh john what's your what's your cask i mean as you said you using you are experimenting a lot and marrying a lot and using different things but is there sort of a cask policy or size that you're uh, not or? necessarily. So I guess I have um, a bit of a, a personal prejudice against small 20 litre casks. Uh, we have eight or, or nine now on site total. Um, much like what Casey said, I just feel like they're very hit and miss and we're, we're small and maybe we just don't have the resources to keep an eye on them. Um, but that's not to say that's, you know, everybody sort of treats things differently and has a different opinion. That's okay. Uh, so we we landed a container a while ago of quite a few 40 and 50 and 80 litre Hero distillery casks. Uh, so that's what we've primarily been filling. Um, I feel like 40 and 50 litre is the sweet spot for the, these, you know, so-called quicker maturation whiskies where mm. um, we're in a bit of a unique position as well where we're not really suffering from having to get whiskey out the door. Um, I mean, it's what we're in May, mid-May, and we haven't even done a release for 2020 yet. Mm. Uh, we're, we're very patient. The director is very patient. He knows it takes time. So we can just wait until the whiskey's ready. Um, yeah. We're moving to a larger, moving to a lot more larger casks now. We've filled quite a lot of hundreds. Uh, we've got some 200s on site, 300s. I've bought a couple of big port pipes just because I think they look really fucking cool. <laughs> um, some people think that I'm batshit crazy for not cutting them down into small casks, you know, 50 year old pot pipes. But the reality is we have no pressure to get whiskey out the door from these casks. So we can leave them for 10, 15, 20 years, whatever it takes. Uh, and because of that, we, we have a diverse range, like literally just good wood, just good finishes, buy it in, yep. work out if we want to finish something in it or, or, you know, just new maker cask and, and go from there. We don't really, 
have anything set in stone. Yep. Uh, very cool. Um, there was actually a comment from Richard Matthews here that says he's commenting on the 20 and 50 litre casks at Sullivan's. He says, that was a painful process. <laughs> and um, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> and uh, Gary says, uh, not too shithouse as a classic uh, Bill quote. Yes, of course, you can't, you can't have Bill in the stream and not the not too shit house quote. Um, I've got a Lafroy bottle that's got on the label not too shit house. Ask Dan Woolley about it. <laughs> Dan's commented a couple of times. I'm going to have to. Oh, here he goes. He says he got, Dan actually got 10 of those 50 litre Sullivan's casks too. Uh, and he's since refilled them with um, uh, Tawny and they're in the, his garage seasoning for the next six months before he fill, starts filling them with Peter you make. Very cool. Wow. Oh, I'd really be interested to try them in the future, Dan. Good on you, Dan. There you go, mate. Um, and uh, Richard also says that Old Kempton worked very closely with the local vineyards. Yep, that's very cool. That's, yeah. And, of course, that would work. Um, and the Crafty says, however, he, he, um, he falls on the other side of the equation. He says, uh, in my opinion, 20-litre uh, casks are great seasoning for cask vattings. I, I call them the salt and pepper of casks, the seasonings yeah, of casks. Yeah. Okay, very cool. That's yeah, a good, good okay. comment. Um, and I feel your passion, John. Exactly. David King says that. Fantastic. Um, so I'm, uh, just, just for everyone who's been tuning in and everyone, uh, all the new people have tuned in as well, I'm here tonight with chatting with four absolute legends of the Tasmanian whiskey scene, Bill Lark, Casey and Jane Overeem, or should I say Sawford, sorry, Jane Sawford as well, and, um, and John Jarvis from Devils slash Hobart Whiskey. This, is, um, this, is a great, uh, this has been a great chat. Uh, it's, this has been really good and I'm taking some great questions. One of the topics that we wanted to touch on tonight, which has been, there's been lots of questions and comments about, is about pricing and about and where, how Australian whiskey is perceived. Uh, and we'll touch on it both on nationally, but also internationally, which I think is an interesting discussion. If, if I can just uh, preface it by saying, I think the first ever ovary I purchased, uh, <laughs> I, bought, I bought directly off you, Jane, and I bought it in the, in the shed. And uh, I paid you cash in hand and it was, I think, three fifty. 300 or 350, somewhere around there. Oh, what? Yeah, it was a car, was, yeah, yeah, it was a car strength. It was a port cast car strength, OHD 004 or something like that. Uh, oh. And uh, I can't Oh, remember. yeah, okay. That was the yeah. first release. Yep. Yeah, first release. And uh, I think it was 300 or 350 or something, and, and somewhere around there. And I remember <laughs> thinking, yeah, okay, well, that's what Australian whiskey costs. And, and I realized that I'd be able to buy a bottle here and there for that kind of price, but that's definitely not sort of your daily drinker kind of price. And and I and I was, I was sort of I was ready for that. And then uh, the industry changed a lot over the last ten years, of, especially in terms of pricing and, and perception of pricing. Uh, if I'm to remark on one tidbit from my history was when I went to the uh, launch tasting for the very first New World projects from Dave Vitale and his uh, new distillery in Starwood, and he uh, he launched this New World projects bottling. It was 700 mils, which was unusual for Australian whiskey, except for Overeem, of course, and a few others, but. Uh, it, was, it was a 700 mil bottle. It was cask strength and it was a hundred dollars. And we went, no, nah, that's, that's not right. Mm. It's like, no, no, they're a hundred. They're just project bottlings and everyone rushed for them and they were sold out in minutes. And it was sort of like, okay, well, this is a bit of a turning circle. And it's a bit of a, bit of a, a strange shift in the price of Australian whiskey as a whole. And then of course, rewind, what, two years ago, we saw twofold and we've seen, of course, I'm talking examples from bigger distilleries in many cases, but uh, with economies of scale to be able to support that. What are your takes on where pricing sits? What, what will the market bear? And what do you see it as being uh, a strategy moving forward and perception? Um, look, Matt, I thought you were going to say when you were first in the distillery with me and you bought a bottle of Overeem for $90 because that's what it used to be. Wow, you really, you really did rip me off there. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, you said $350. I was like, what? Oh, yeah, wow. <laughs> no, it definitely um, wasn't $90. No, uh, <laughs> I think I bought a 40% yeah. one for $90 maybe, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, 43 43 Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, look, yeah I watched the, the price of Overeem rise since we started in 2012. So, yeah, it did go up a lot from 2012 to now 2020. Um, but it went up as it got uh, hard, to, hard to get. So, right. you know, supply yeah, supply and demand. Because, um, mm -hmm. you know, we I think the at one point it was probably 160, that was probably where it was probably at its most um, popular, I think. Um, yep. And you probably remember, Matt, like I'd put a barrel online and reach out to the mailing list and it was gone in a couple of minutes. 
bit yeah. like Dan. I remember those days. I remember those days. Yes. Yeah. And um, yeah, it was sort of around those times that the pricing was going up and, and also, yeah, there wasn't a lot of Tasmanian whiskey to buy. So um, I'll let others comment on, on the rest of that. But yeah, it is continually changing. I mean, you... What were you going to say? Oh, my, my, my thoughts on it are that, um, you know, at 240 and 250 a bottle, um, and some of these are only in 500 mil bottles, um, and also, uh, yeah, the, the, the age, I mean, the age doesn't really come into it, but they've been matured in um, 20 litre casks, um, and, and often um, are not, they haven't got the depth of character. Um, so, I think they're overpriced. Um, yeah. I would like to see the um, a, a premium Tasmanian whiskey um, around the one hundred and ninety to two hundred dollars for a seven hundred ml bottle. That would be my uh, my aim. I think that's a fair price for a for a crafted handcrafted whiskey um, in today's market. Mm. It, it's that's the thing. It's in today's market. It has to be uh, it has to be competitive, not just with Australian whiskey, but it's it's the 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 choice of uh, the consumer's choice on the shelf these days is wider than it's ever been uh from all world uh, from all around the world of course um bill your thoughts yeah this is um it's an interesting question and um when i started mm. i could have charged whatever i like i suppose i didn't have a clue mm. but i was very fortunate that somebody said bill there is a formula for working out how to charge for your whiskey to make sure you stay in business. You know, at the end of the day, you, you charge what you need to charge because there is a cost of production. There's mm. a cost to getting it to market. And there is a, an industry formula in the, in the liquor industry that tells you that, you know, once you know your cost price, and that varies from distillery to distillery. So I don't think we can pick a price and say that, that should be applicable to all distilleries. Mm. Um, each distillery will have to work out what, and a, and a really good, crafted small craft distillery is probably going to have to charge more because their cost is going to be more mm. um, and so as long as you're getting that basic margin on top of your cost price which becomes your distributor price and we know a distributor wants 25 percent commission off wholesale and then when the when it gets sold to a retail outlet they'll want to put a margin of 25 to 35 or more percent on top of that so you can work out what your retail price is so when we started we we use that formula to price our whiskey, knowing that if we do that, then we should be able to stay in business. We should be covering our cost of production and allowing for going to market and running an office and running a cellar door and things. And, and that's worked pretty well. Our very first release was $78, but in time, the cost of production went up, barrels, cost of barrels and everything else. Do you have a time, um, have a time machine somewhere that I can borrow just for a day or two? <laughs> yeah, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> pick up some, um, pick up some LD001 for uh, for seventy eight bucks. That'd be nice. Yeah, wouldn't that be good? <laughs> Look, um, I, I think Tim Duckett talks about the market correction. He's even put out a whiskey called the market correction, and yeah. I think the market will determine what it's prepared to pay for our whiskey or John's whiskey or Overing whiskey into the future. They'll look at. They, they, if they want that whiskey and they understand that it's cost that distillery a certain effort to get it onto the marketplace, then maybe $150 is the right price. Maybe $250 is the right mm -hmm. price. And if you want it, and I know, I guess, um, I know some people that have to be price conscious. So, um, but if there's a certain whiskey I want, um, you know, I look at the price, I might shatter, but I think, now look, I really want that particular whiskey from scotland and i'm going to pay 300 dollars for it because i really want it um yeah. i might not buy one every week but at that particular point in time i want that whiskey and i'm prepared to pay for it um well you've, so you've, done, you've done that as a as a, even a society member yourself i remember the number of uh three dot something you bought you bought off us at one point well they were <laughs> sensational and <laughs> they were worth every cent and they weren't <laughs> cheap necessarily but it was something i really wanted at the time and so pro, pro, i don't think you know, it's, it's a, something we're going to be talking about forever and a day. Um, and I think, I think the market will sort, sort things out, uh, you know. Um, anyway, it, it, yeah. yeah, we'll keep talking about it for a long time, Matt. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's an evolving discussion. Um, John, from your perspective, it, especially, again, 
breaking into the market is, is an interesting point in your in your perspective as well in more recent years. Yeah, so I think Bill touched on it really well. Like, um, you know, people will, people will pay what they want for a product. Uh, the market drives the price of whiskey. Uh, in our situation, in our case, all I knew is that um, we wanted to go sub two hundred dollars for our five hundred mil whiskey. Our first release was one ninety five. Um, we've since been working to make it, I guess, more approachable. Ultimately, I want people drinking our whiskey. I don't want people just buying our whiskey and putting it on the shelf to collect dust. Like, we want to share our whiskey with people. We want bars to be pouring. We want people to be buying and taking it to barbecues. And to achieve that, I guess, we need to make it accessible. Um, yeah. I mean, I justify buying really nice, expensive bottles with my wife by saying, it's going to go up in value. I'm going to put it on the shelf. It's <laughs> I just drink them. I just drink all of them. I drink everything I buy. Um, and it's, it's just a market. But even beyond production costs, tax, all that sort of stuff, I think it's the story and the engagement with the customers and the connection. And people buy into that and people want to be a part of the brand. And, um, you know, I feel like 90% of the customers will just be happy to pay whatever you want them to pay because they want to be a part of that experience. And they know they can ring any of us up and have a chat and, they can come and see the distilleries and we're all really quite small in the grand scheme of things. Um, and, and that's worth that small premium as well. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. And that's, I think that's part, it's part of that journey, isn't it? And that mm. that's going to change over time and you're going to have to adjust, I guess, according to market and, and, and what's, and what's going to suit the market as well, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's do a bit of quick fire before we, um, before we finish up. Um, there's a few sort of a uh, few questions that are, that are, been jumping in here and when i say a few i mean lots um so but some of them are definitely sort of yes or no sort of uh i think answers so we'll do a bit of a um uh, a bit of a quick fire round uh okay here's a good one uh what do you what do you appreciate least in a whiskey and this is just sort of a, a general comment I, I i can get the ball rolling by saying uh for me it's um sherry cask sulfur taint I, I don't, I, I enjoy a sulfured whiskey, a spirit sulfur, but I think a, a, the sulfur taint from a sherry cask can sometimes put me off a little bit. But um, what do you appreciate least in a whiskey? John, do you for want to kick us off? Oh. <laughs> for me, it's uh, dry. Dry. Stand, having a whiskey and going, too dry. Okay. Yeah, yeah, dry on the palate. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, Bill, you, you've, uh, you've had a fair few drams. You might, you might uh, be able to answer that one. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. When I first started drinking whiskey, there were things I didn't like. I didn't like whiskey matured in a bourbon cask. Um, but then I learned to discover that we shouldn't get too fussy about a particular style of whiskey because if, if you think about it, there's a time for every whiskey. There's a time when everybody wanted a peated whiskey and nothing else would suit them. And, and I used to say, look, I love my peated whiskies as much as anybody else, but um, don't forget about some of those beautiful, delicate floral whiskies that, you know, they're good whiskies too. Don't put those aside. And yeah. there's, a, there's a time and a place for a, um, a, a whiskey at breakfast. I mean, you know, everybody knows I talk about a breakfast whiskey. And, um, oh, yes. <laughs> I, um, I usually wait till seven in the morning, but, uh, but, that's, <laughs> but, but there's a, you know, like if I'm with, with certain friends <coughs> up in the highlands with a campfire going, there's a type of whiskey that I'll appreciate there. Um, there are times when I thought I didn't want a sweet whiskey, but there are times I like a sweeter whiskey. There are times when I really appreciate a dry whiskey. It's, um, it's a strange thing, but I think what I've learned to do is, and I'm probably I'm guilty of having too many whiskeys, I've learned to appreciate all the different styles, but at the right time in the right place with the right people. Yeah, okay. That's, uh, you're, you're truly a diplomat sometimes, Bill, and I appreciate that answer. <laughs> John, what would, how would you go? I feel like Bill stole my answer. I was going to say whiskey is very much for me a mood thing. Um, you know, I bought, and don't hate me for this, my first ever experience with Lafroy was I bought a bottle of Lafroy 10 on a whim. I got it home and I absolutely hated it. It's the worst whiskey I'd ever had. Um, <laughs> and I've got a workstation and behind this monitor, I've got, you know, a few open bottles that are easily accessible. Um, <laughs> and uh, the Lafroy sat there for a while. And then just one day I was like, wow, I could actually really just go this like, Lafroy whiskey um and so i think what bill said is you know pretty similar to what i would have said uh it's just there's a time and place um you know the most sulfur infused whiskey or the driest whiskey or or this or that 
doesn't mean that I don't appreciate it. Maybe I just don't feel like it at the time. Uh, in, in the right company, in the right mood, at the right time. Um, just anything. Uh, whiskey, you can break it down. You can just go through, you know, nine things you love and one thing you hate. And uh, that, that one thing may just overpower at that time, but the next time you go back to it, it might not be an issue. Yeah, awesome. Um, there's been some uh, lack of finish has been some of them. Uh, chewing on a dry stick, hate that. Dry, I agree with, says um, Peter Bignall. Uh, uh, lots, lots, of, lots of comments on that very question as well. I'm going to finish with one more quick fire. Um, otherwise, we could talk all night. Um, for each of you, who is, your, who is your hero in whiskey? Now, the reason why that question is there is because a lot of people will say, Casey over him is their hero. Or people will say, your luck is their hero. So in many cases, I like to know who your hero is in your whiskey journey, someone who's been almost like a, a inspiration or mentor or guide for you in your journey. Uh, Jane, kick All us right, off. Well, for oh, me, okay. it would be uh, Matt Bailey, Bill Lark, Casey Overham, and Jane Overham. <laughs> 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 Good answer, John. Yeah, yeah, well. Good one. The Tasmanian distilling industry has been so supportive. Like I look up to all these people. I really, it was a quick, quick question you asked. I'll give a really quick story. So uh, when we first started up, I remember I rang up Bill Lark, you know, the godfather of whiskey. I'm going to ring him up. And I spoke to him. He's like, no, you come out, just sort of have a chat. Like, look at what we're doing, try some casks. And um, I was petrified. Like, what to expect? And Bill come in and he, he brought Mark Nicholson. And they sort of sat down at a cask and had a whiskey and a chat. And I talked about fishing and motorbikes. And I was like, is this the industry? Like, this is so <laughs> relaxed and cool. This is exactly what we want to be doing. Yeah, um, yeah, very cool. You know, much the same, you know, all pretty much all of the Tasmanian distillers have come out at some point. I can ring anyone up and say, oh, this cask, I don't know what's happening with it. You come out, you have a chat, try it. Um, so it's a bit of a bit of a shitty answer because it's, you know, non-committal. But the Tasmanian uh -huh. industry has sort of helped guide me and they're the ones that I've been looking up to uh, so for our journey. So who does the Godfather look up to then? Who was your hero? Well, if you say I'm John Grant, I'll accept that as an answer. But I, I'm uh, uh, it, it, strangely enough, that's exactly what I'm going to say. Oh, I, but cool. I will say quickly before that that uh, the whole of the Scottish industry has been a tremendous source of inspiration to me. Um, but a couple of things happened to me the night that Lynn and I said let's start a distillery. We toasted it with a 15-year-old Glenn Farquhar. Mm. Two weeks after getting my license, absolutely shitting myself because I had no idea what I was doing, the phone rang at 10 o'clock at night and it was John Grant from Glen Farkless. And I'm going like, shit, John, how can I help you? And he's going, nah, Bill, how can I help you? He said, uh, I hear from a distributor in Hobart that you've got a license to make whiskey. Would you let me help you make good whiskey? And we've talked on the phone for a long time. So I have to say, in all honesty, you know, um, it was spooky that... I toasted it with a Glenn Farkless. And I remember saying to Lynn, wouldn't it be great one day if we could make a whiskey like this? And I'd like to think, I'd like to think we're getting very close to that. Um, but for him to ring me at 10 o'clock at night um, was tremendous. So mm. um, John Grant, yes, he, he's the guy I would have to tip my hat to uh, first and foremost. But then there's a whole host of other great people in the industry. Oh, yeah. Be yeah. Just as helpful. And uh, Casey and Jane. Well, for, for me, um, yeah, Bill. Of course it's Bill. Yeah, there we go. That's nice. <laughs> oh, uh, Bill, Bill. That a Zoom moment, a Friday night Zoom moment, folks. Do you get the warm and fuzzy through your, through your screen? <laughs> yeah, Bill's a hero to me, but I, I have got some others there. And, um, I mean, we had, um, we've had, uh, we, you know, Bill and I went together to Scotland back in 2005, and we met a lot of great people on that, on that trip. And um, a few that come to mind was Jim McEwen, and I've um, had dealings with him uh, a, a, a number of times since. And uh, I suppose he would probably be, uh, I, I love his gin, I love his, uh, you know, his, his whiskies, and um, yeah, generally, yeah, it, it's, yeah just, just generally a good bloke. Yeah. Yeah. True. Jane. Well, you probably all know my answer to this one, but it's obviously this man right here, Casey. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's got the deepest pockets. No, yeah. no bias at um, all, right? No bias. <laughs> no, 100%. It's Dad all the way. I've, um, I've 
I wouldn't be in this industry if it wasn't for Dad. He introduced it to me at the ripe old age of 18 and I really have loved it ever since. And, um, yeah, he's just always been behind us to to keep going with it. Even when he sold Overeem, there was never, you know, a doubt in my mind that he wasn't going to support me in pursuing um, my dream in the whiskey industry. Um, and now to have Overeem back where it where it started is even more awesome and yeah we just we have so much fun together it's given us a an awesome relationship and an awesome bond decanting barrels together and mucking around with whiskey it's the yeah it's awesome and i love it (laughs) (laughs) awesome um well all each of you have been a a part of uh my whiskey journey obviously and i've uh john we've done we've not known each other a very long time but uh um but in the case of all the rest of you, I, we've known each other for a while. And I, I think it's, I just want to thank you all uh, so much uh, for taking uh, time on your Friday night. Uh, I know it's, it's, it's much easier during isolation, but I'd like to think this is the kind of thing we could do uh, even outside of isolation. And I feel like this is the kind of conversation that with the great questions from members, the great uh, commentary and the great sort of, I guess, even sometimes digging a bit deeper on the surface of sometimes the Tassie whiskey industry and giving those an insight into what's happening. Uh, both day to day and long term is is uh, they find fascinating. I find fascinating, and it's I want to thank you all so much for being a part of this uh, tonight. So thanks again. Uh, thank you everyone who's been tuning in and asking so many questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to absolutely every single one. There's been heaps and heaps and heaps of comments on all the channels that we're broadcasting to at the moment. Um, we'll be back next week for live stream, of course, kicking off Monday night. Uh, the guests for all next week have all been locked in, so it's, we're looking forward to a big week again next week. So, of course, I'm going to try and get some sleep over the weekend. And I um, appreciate, thank you so much, John Jarvis, Bill Lark, Casey Overham, Jane Sawford, thank you so much for all being a part of it tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, everyone else. Thanks, Thanks, Matt. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Stay on, stay on for the moment, guys. I'll, um, I'll catch you all soon. We'll see you all for the, um, uh, the stream starting back on Monday. That's Monday night. Next Monday night, we've got some really special guests lined up. I'll see you all soon. Signing off, Matt Bailey, Scotchmont Whiskey Society. Uh, have a great weekend, everyone, and we'll see you soon. Slanjava from everyone in the channel. Slanjava. Uh.